Great. I want to welcome everyone to our September 9th, 2024 school board meeting. Will everyone stand with me to say the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Well, it's great to have our first meeting now that school has started and the summer, summer, what, what the military calls it, the 101 days of summer are now completed. We want to welcome everyone who's watching online and anyone that is with us tonight. I want to open up for public participation. We have two times at the beginning and at the end. If you'd like to come and speak, please state your name and address. And if you are a student, you do not need to state your address. Seeing none, we will go to informational updates. I will turn it over to Bill Olson for the superintendent update. All right, thank you very much. We have had an excellent beginning to the school year. Um, I can't think of any major issues. You know, usually there are always some busing issues that uh, accompany the first day or two or week of school, but uh, it's been excellent. We uh, actually, I don't recall us having any lost children that uh, usually accompanies the first day or two, two of school. Um, staff has been great. Uh, administration has been very um, exuberant about the start of school and it's I think it's one of the best uh, I've ever seen in, in the years I've been in this profession. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you to the parents also for being prepared, having the kids prepared. Um, you know, it is, in fact, a team effort, as we found out with the Patriots game yesterday, um, and uh, things have gone very smoothly, so we want to thank them. Uh, I'll let Amy address when, when uh, she speaks about the tomorrow being the PDD, PD day. Uh, you know, that is um, uh, the day that also the town has its election, and the primary election the state, across the state, certainly, uh, and that's why we have the full PD day for school security reasons. Sometimes we don't have PD, sometimes we do. Uh, but we coexist with the voters. Uh, Matt has always made arrangements for alternative parking, and so, um, you know, we look forward to a great day. Amy's done a tremendous amount of work on professional development, and she can explain that. Uh, we're gonna begin uh, either this week or next week at cable programs again. Uh, we're looking forward to that, and I have a few other updates. Our enrollment uh, at the beginning of the year. Now, this is without, I've taken out, because we don't have the precise numbers just yet, so I've taken out the um, homeschool uh, numbers uh, and the out of district, because that's still settling in also. We're down 55 students. Uh, we um, are down in the 20s at the lower elementary, upper elementary, and at the high school, at the middle school. Interestingly, we, we have an increase of 27 students at the high school. So uh, we'll keep a careful eye on that. Um, as you know, there have been um, an article or two recently about the development in Merrimack in particular, one of the fastest growing communities in the state of, of New Hampshire. And that always brings, if it's residential in nature, always brings some impact on school enrollments. So just some general news, and I have to tell you, the staff has been very enthusiastic. Um, uh, received a message from Cindy Poirier uh, of, on our uh, support staff, um, and Cindy has always been very active in the school, school district, been a wonderful employee for many years. Well, her daughter works for Timberland, and this year she was uh, awarded a grant, her daughter Ashley, uh, to supply teachers with classroom supplies and put together swag bags containing hats, sunglasses, and all sorts of interesting materials uh, for each teacher. And they also supplied uh, over 20 backpacks for the school. And I'll send around a picture. Uh, kind of looks like a holiday morning, a Christmas morning. Or, uh, there's all sorts of goodies that uh, have been delivered by Cindy's daughter, Ashley, and we thank her. We thank Timberland. Uh, corporation. Um, from uh, Beth um, Tomulovic at, um, yeah, she's a SPED, uh, uh, she came from a SPED position 
And she said, uh, from my very unique perspective, I wanted to let you know how impressed I am with the administration, curriculum coordinators, and technology teams here at JMUs. She said the professionalism is extraordinary, and uh, I feel welcome, capable, and off to a strong start, one of the best in my entire career. So thank you to Beth for saying that. Uh, you know, it's culture is everything. And what we've been trying to do across the school district, staff has been wonderful. It's created a strong, supportive, trusting, respectful, collaborative culture, and one that is welcoming. And that's something you sh that you can feel when you, when you enter an organization. We hear it oftentimes during interviews that the candidates have felt welcomed in the schools, they felt welcomed in the central office, and that makes a big, big difference. Uh, I want to let you know that we have heard from Tammy Lambro also that the uh, middle, uh, the Merrimack High School, excuse me, online bookstore is now open for business. And so uh, check the website out tonight. Today they've got all sorts of interesting items. Um, I'll double check to make sure that that link is on the high school's webpage. But uh, Timmy's done a great job in getting that up and running. Uh, Courtney LaFrancois has indicated that uh, the Vasi field hockey has started and the first goal of the season was scored by uh, uh, Ava Martin and uh, that Annabelle, Annabelle Cassidy has been dominating in the goal for the, uh, uh, the field hockey uh, team. And so that is off and running. Uh, we have, um, let me go to the next one here. Sarah Campbell and Liz Dumay from the high school have informed me that uh, Merrimack is hosting the Granite State Challenge qualifying exams this year for the 24-25 season. Uh, this is an event that all teams must participate in to qualify to be on the show. Only the top teams in the state make it to the taping of the show, and you know that we've had one of the best teams in the entire state for a number of years. And Sarah, uh, is starting a chapter of the Science National Honor Society at Merrimack High School, which is extraordinarily positive. Um, you know, uh, we have lots of great teachers, and I remember several years ago being at the Rotary end-of-year uh, dinner in recognition of the top 10 scholars. And out of those 10 top 10 scholars, I would say probably seven or eight mentioned Sarah as one of their favorite teachers. And uh, well-educated, great teacher, great disposition, loves students, and, and it shows. Um, want to uh, let you know also, we sent out something today. I've been working with Amy, Matt, Melissa, with uh, Reggie Bates, Josh Pelton from the uh, Union. Uh, we have revised the... Um, <laughs> service, I was going to say student, the service learning project program. That is a, an amount of money that's in the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, it's about $150,000 that has been in the collective bargaining agreement for uh, a, a while now. And it is in there for the intention of increasing the training to students. Um, somewhere along the line, that process became very complicated, uh, became a little bit convoluted in that some of the activities that were being funded were co-curricular in nature. So we have uh, revised that program. We've put together new instructions. We have detailed the, the types of activities, types of growth, professional development, and training activities that will qualify. We've specified one of four tiers of compensation that a person will receive. We have a new online application form that will involve uh, the principal review of that respective building. Uh, Amy, um, the MTA will have two members, um, and they will, one from the elementary level, the second from uh, grades six through 12. Uh, they will be involved in the review process, but the person serving as the superintendent will have the final say, and it will not be subject to an appeal uh, or grievance, okay? We want to make sure that the activities that are involved in the service learning project uh, are more directly related to curriculum and instruction, to student and staff uh, development. 
uh, and it began, uh, in my opinion, it began to stray somewhat from, from that. And so we want to refocus it. We think it's going to work well. We think it's going to benefit the, uh, the district. Where we want the people to be able to share their learning experience with the staff across the district. And so we, uh, we have put together the instructions and directions, uh, the criteria. Um, and so uh, let me just read to you the four criteria that any project must address supporting the instructional program, addressing school board goals, assisting the accomplishment of one or more of the strategic plan initiatives, and represent evidence-based education best practice. And so uh, we'll be sharing with you as we go along the projects that are being submitted and those that are being funded. Um, you know, we may make, through our review process, the decision that not all of them will be funded, but it'll be for a particular uh, reason, okay? Uh, from Mastercola uh, Elementary School, uh, Michelle Romain has indicated that uh, the fourth graders are very much involved in lunch and bus, uh, bus buddies, and that they are working with the kindergarten students uh, every day to assist them uh, during lunch, to um, collaborate with them, to be friends with them, but n uh, not only that, but also to help them uh, getting on uh, the buses in the afternoon, and so I commend them. Uh, it's a great collaboration. Uh, as you know, a kindergarten child will look with great delight at a fourth grader, like uh, the sixth graders look at the seniors in high school, and so, um, you know, I commend them for that, that great activity. Ron Beck from the high school has indicated that the choir has been invited to share a concert with the University of New Hampshire Chamber Singers on November 21st at UNH. Uh, the performance time is to be determined, and Ron will provide us with uh, some additional information. Um, as he indicated, and I think we all agree, just being invited to participate is a great feather in the bonnet of the high school choir. They have, we have one of the best music programs in the area, and um, you know it's great to see not only the focus on academics, strict academics and sports, but the fine performing arts, which are extraordinarily important. Uh, from Bonnie uh, Pancho over at RFS, um, Lini Haddad, I don't know if you remember Lini, she was here with her folks um, earlier in the spring, she was conducting a uh, Eagle project and she has over the weekend installed the first RFS Gaga Ball game and our third and fourth graders are, are thrilled at that. And Bonnie mm -hmm. thanks the Parent Faculty Association mm -hmm. for on, uh, organizing and purchasing uh, the Hoover Net and Bucket Swings for their North Playground and in addition the uh, Reeds Ferry Courtyard Playground has been completed for the children in the school. And so um, from Jim Wojwoda, um, also from the high school, his, his civic students have a chance to earn bonus points by going to the polls tonight with parent or guardians to observe the voting process. Uh, they have research candidates for the governor and U.S. House of Representatives, and they're holding a three-class-wide vote on Wednesday. And from Elizabeth Sheehan, who is one of our new teachers over RFS, I uh, was talking with Elizabeth last week, a uh, school visit. I'm very enthusiastic. Um, she said, I wanted to share with you today, my first grade class got to start earning terrific tickets. An idea shared with me by my mentor teacher, Kelly Chiapetta. Our class has already earned 66 total tickets, and they are saving up the tickets to purchase desk pets, which are little erasers, and so whatever works, okay? <laughs> so lots of, lots of great things. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to wear the tie that might some people consider it tacky, but I wear this when on important occasions when tomorrow people are asked to express their democratic rights through the voting process, but also very importantly on Wednesday of this week. It is the 23rd anniversary of 9-11. Uh, some of us have had friends or acquaintances who were killed on that date, and um, we will always, always remember them. And that is it. Any comments or questions from the board? 
It was an outstanding update. Thank you, Bill. I was just going to say, that's hard to follow. It's really <laughs> covered a lot of things, right? I'm out. I'm done. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're done here tonight, yep. Matt. We're obsolete. Um, I guess as advertised, I'll just let you know, I would agree with Bill that the opening of the school year has gone really, really well. And I know that some of you are also in education, so I hope that the school year has opened for you as, as well as it's opened here. Um, I do want to take a minute to share the teachers, to thank the teachers that opened their classrooms. We had three full PD days before students arrived on, on Thursday. Uh, one of those days is called the Classroom Setup Day, and that is essentially teachers come in, uh, they get their classrooms and their office areas ready for students. And then what we've tried to do the last couple of years is to have one day that's district initiatives and then one day that's building initiatives, and that's really worked out well. Uh, so on the district day, um, we had a variety of activities really that are role specific. Um, so if you were implementing Wit and Wisdom or Vis or Open Syed or any of the new programs that I'm excited to talk about later in the meeting, um, you would have some very targeted training on those programs and the materials that go along with them. Um, if they weren't introducing or implementing a new program, then they would be looking at meeting in their professional learning um, team. So we had our unified arts teams doing that, um, and we're continuing our work with NHLI on competencies and common assessments. So they've been back and they've been doing department work as well. Um, that will be similar similarly repeated tomorrow as Bill said we have a full uh, PD day and and we will you know we will have a lot of those same activities because implementation and the professional development will be that thread throughout the entire school year um, the last thing that I um, wanted to mention as as Bill said the parking tomorrow and the polls and things like that we've tried to work out with Matt's help um, and also Rich Desmond you know making sure that the poll areas are, are safe um, for the people that are coming but also for the teachers so uh, we're gonna work hard to coexist it's a really exciting time um, a primary and and, you know, as we look to November as well. So thank you. That's all I have for tonight. Any comments or questions? And I want to thank the teachers who opened their classrooms to you. The blessing of being a high school teacher is I never had to decorate, but I couldn't if I wanted to. Those elementary teachers do an outstanding job getting their rooms welcoming for those kids. You know, it's interesting when you walk around. I was not a Pinterest teacher. I was a math teacher, right? So you're like, here is the multiplication table and some formulas. <laughs> but some teachers, you walk in and you think, how did you do all of this? It's, it's amazing. Yeah, my but. <laughs> thank you, Matt. We'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Not nearly as engaging or as you know exciting as is Bill or, or Amy, but we, we did work. Voting is tomorrow. Uh, parking for the staff or uh, JMU's is going to be at the American Legion. Uh, we're going to have shuttle buses going back and forth to bring those staff from the Legion to uh, JMU's. Uh, at the middle school, parking is at Bishop Field, that parking lot when you for first roll in. Um, their bus is going to be provided there for the staff to be shuttled to the building and back. As the day drags on and people come and go, you know, what will happen is people, who, staff who go to lunch or something like that, they can move their cars to the back of the parking lot, but the, the, the spaces in front of the two voting locations is going to be kept clear for the townspeople to come and, come and vote. So we're preparing for that right, uh, you know, today and, uh, you know, tomorrow morning. We've been doing this for a number of years, providing transportation and having the staff park at alternate locations. So it's just continuation of, uh, you know, history, and it's worked out well for us. Um, also, Bill mentioned the, the, the buses on the first day. Uh, something that we historically have done is wait for the call to come in from STA. So at around, I forget what time it was, it was around 4.30 or so, I got the call from Michelle Bancroft, and I'm going, oh, that, that's a little early. What's, what's going on here? And she says, all the buses are in, all the kids are you know, home, everything went well. Um, we're, that's it. First day is done. I think Bill and I looked at one another going, wow, <laughs> this, is, this is pretty good. You know, you don't want to jinx yourself, you know, but uh, I was very pleased that the first day went off without any major incident because there's always something I mean kids get on the wrong bus it's it's you know it, it's something that you really have to you know plan to hear but it was good news that we, we didn't get in the, into that situation I'd also like to thank um, our maintenance and custodial staff 
for working very hard over the summertime, making sure that the buildings were clean and ready for the teachers to be able to populate their classrooms and decorate their classrooms and get ready for the first day of school. So a big shout out to, to those, those individuals who worked exceedingly diligently over the summertime to get everything ready. It's tough because the buildings are used. If people don't think that our buildings aren't used all year round, they're used all year round. So it's tough to operate around um, initiatives that are going on in the district, important initiatives that are going on in the district as far as you know, getting kids in summer school and everything like that. But they did it, and they do it every single year. And I just don't want that to go unnoticed. So thank you very much. Jenna. So I just want to say I'm glad you mentioned the bus situation because I was not the one getting my child, my sixth grader, on or off the bus the first day. And so when I left my husband to do it, I said, you know, this is the time. It says the bus is going to come, but, like, we're talking a 15-minute window, you know, because the first day it's always, you know, so don't get all huffy if, you know, it's 10 or 15 minutes late. And then same thing when she's, if, you know, she's getting off the bus and it, she's not there yet. Nothing's happened. And he came back and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. The bus is there at the right time. And I was like, it was? Okay, that's fantastic. And it has been literally almost on the nose exactly every day. And I'm like, this has never happened before. So kudos to whatever happened because it really did go off without a hitch, at least as far as I can hear. When, you've had, when you have a company like STA that you've had an ongoing relationship with, it kind of builds a lot of trust and confidence, and they're, willing to, they're very exceedingly willing to make the Merrimack School District proud of their service to us. And so it really kind of counts to have that ongoing relationship that we first forged between the two of us maybe 10, 15 years ago. And so, yeah, the, so you get those kind of results this year. And uh, maybe next year will be a little bit different. But hopefully, you know, things will go good. Yeah. You never know because of traffic or, you, like you said. Or, or, the, the, or, the, or the president of the United States blocks uh, Babusik yes. Lake Road yes. or something like right. that. Yeah, but correct. I was just, I, I think in all the first days I've experienced, and I've had a few with four kids, I was like, wow, okay, I don't think that's ever happened before. Going back a couple of us. decades. Yeah, you're yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to say this is a good reminder to everyone in the public. If a bus is stopped, stop. There have been a couple incidents this first week of people driving around buses. And those kids, sometimes they're coming from across the road and they're waiting for the driver to wave them on. But sometimes the kids don't wait. So it is up to us as the grownups and our drivers and especially our teen drivers. If you see a bus stopped, stop. Our bus drivers care deeply for our kids and so do we. All right, moving on to the school board update. Uh, this Saturday, since we don't have a student rep update, I, I want to mention that on Saturday, CHOP, our first robotics club, is having their Merrimack and Mayhem, or Mayhem and Merrimack event. It's from 8.30 until 3 at the high school gym. Um, they were very kind to invite me, and I said, well, I am taking care of my two-year-old grandson. Can he come? Because he'd probably love it. And they were like, yes, come on. So uh, we're going to go over there on Saturday. This is a non-competition kind of just fun preview event to their season. Um, you should have received an email from NHSBA with the first set of resolutions. We'll be going over those at our next meeting, discussing if we have any concerns or, or um, anything you'd like me to bring up at the delegate meeting, which is in October. Also, as we've mentioned, it's election day tomorrow. I encourage everyone who would like their voice to be heard to go and uh, make it heard tomorrow. It is a preview of what we'll be looking forward to in November. And I appreciate the town of Merrimack working with us uh, with not having school and yet using our facilities. It's been a great relationship with the town for those elections. And we look forward to uh, at our next meeting to have our student representative and see who we're going to have join us and partner with us here at the board. Okay, we are going to go back and now that hopefully everybody's home from vacation, that they are watching us tonight to hear the strategic plan. So I'm gonna turn this over to Bill. Well, we uh, presented this uh, to you at our last meeting and um, Hopefully, you've had a chance to review it even more carefully than what you were able to do uh, in the brief time period that you possessed it. Um, I know we took some comments at the last meeting. Um, I did make one change, 
uh, and that was um, at you know, Ken's uh, notice that we had we had forgotten to put any reference in there to any type of planning process, not construction, but planning and feasibility of a performing arts center in there. So we did, I did include that. It's item number 14 under uh, one of the facilities goals. Um, other than that, a couple of typos we corrected. Um, we'd be glad to answer any questions, but we'd like to seek your approval on this so we can publish it. Uh, we will publish it online, but we'd like to have some hard copies uh, made also. Uh, some people like that tactile experience and like to hold it, mock it up, um, review it carefully. And so we'd like to proceed because this is a budget that precedes, uh, this is a, excuse me, a document that precedes the budget preparation. Uh, we look at this. We look at the goals that we established at our goal setting meeting back in June. Uh, then Amy, Matt, and Melissa and I meet with the staff from each building to hear what uh, they perceive to be the needs of our students and what we're doing well at and what we need to improve upon um, and any new initiatives that they think might be necessary. Obviously, we need to engage in careful prioritization but this is an important document that will allow us to proceed forward with planning for the budget. budget. So um, we'll be glad to try and answer any of your questions. Uh, just know that a lot of thought went into this to the six different uh, components of the, uh, of the strategic plan. And um, I will turn it over to you to see if you have any questions or comments. So I will open it up right now for a motion to accept and a second for discussion. I'll make a motion to accept. So moved by Ken. I'll second. Seconded by Lori. Discussion. I'll just repeat what I said last time in that I think this is a great document. I think it's easy to read. I love the uh, glossary of terms, which I think is so important for folks not in the educational world, what some of these things mean. I like it even more now with the addition of the planning for the fine arts facility. Um, I, I've, yeah, I've had a lot of time to sit and, and kind of digest this, and I think it's a really well put together document. So thank you for all the work. Lori? I was just going to say, um, you know, we talk a lot about where are we going to go, and, and this is our blueprint right here you know it has our mission and it has who's responsible it's a very um, comprehensive document and uh, I appreciate I know how much work went into this and I appreciate it when I read this I was also you know very impressed by the work um, you know at certain points I would like to at school board meetings read our mission because I want people to know that that's our commitment to this community and to our students and our teachers and our staff um, because I think it's really well written. Anyone else? Naomi? I'm basically going to reiterate what I said last time um, too because I was on the committee and recognize my fellow committee members for all of the work that went into this. I just did a quick count on the the list of members on the second or third page in here and there were 27 people on this committee and they represented all stakeholders um, in Merrimack schools. There were parents, there were teachers, there were administration, there were uh, people who serve on in other capacities in town, there was there were business people, there were people who don't have kids in the schools, there were all kinds of stakeholders involved in this and it was a very thorough um, process and I was proud to be part of it. And I would add that it's one of the more stellar strategic plans that I have seen and I have seen quite a few and one of the things I really like is we are being very transparent about the objectives and strategies and the ownership and the accountability. So having this online, having hard copies for those who want, they can keep us accountable very easily with this grid. And I think we probably um, several times during our year need to come back and go, where are we at on these yes. things? So that we're communicating clearly how we are proceeding with the strategic plan. With that, I'll call the question. All those in favor of accepting the strategic plan, say aye. 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 
500. Thank you for your support. Uh, and we will provide you with periodic updates on what we're accomplishing in the strategic plan, but also what we're accomplishing on the goals that we established last uh, June. And I will add to that that at the next meeting, I will be presenting the goals. So I will be providing everyone on the team a PowerPoint for your input. And then we will have the opportunity to present the school board goals that are aligned with the strategic plan. All right. Okay. Try op hockey team. Well, first of all, uh, Adam, thank you for, for being with us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if many people are aware, but an athletic director in a school district is one of the most busy positions in the entire district and because you're out all the time. And Adam came to me uh, last week uh, discussing the uh, hockey season and the fact that uh, the numbers are relatively slim, not only in Merrimack, but also in, in, in two other districts. And for that reason, and I'll let Adam explain a little bit more, we're looking to form a, a, a tri-op, sort of a collaborative team Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Adam, but they would be under the name of the Merrimack uh, Triop team. Is that correct? So, right now we're we'd probably just keep the well. You want me to start and kind of explain everything, sure. and then yes, if you would. So, um, first, this is my daughter's first year going to school. She's in first grade, and we use STA in our town, and that bus was right on time every single time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the experience, but um, That's so a good decision somebody made a lot of years ago, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, a, about a month ago or something, uh, our our um, coach had said something to me, um, and then I was actually confronted by um, an athletic director at Hollis Brookline. Um, Hollis Brookline had co-opted with Dairy Field for the last few years. Um, they've had a good good hockey team uh, we've had a very um, good hockey team for the last few years um, they they um, have hit a point where their numbers are not strong enough to have a hockey team they're not going to be able to have hockey if they don't find a way to co-op with somebody else um, our Merrimack probably this year we have between 13 um, and 15 players uh, for this year as far as we know you know you and we don't know the kids that might show up or might not come that we don't. Um, but uh, we have 12 players graduating in the next two years. And from what we see, we don't have 12 players replacing them. So could we probably survive this year without anybody? Yes. But in another year or two, we might be in the same position they're in, and they're just trying to find a way to keep their kids playing. And um, we might not be in the position of having another school that would want us then. Um, so it, it kind of, um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, in the last year, I actually would never have come up with it by myself. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have foreseen uh, what was going to happen because we've always had strong numbers. I've had students playing the hockey teams for years. I've gone and watched them, and um, I've always been really impressed. It's been a strong program. The kids are really excited. Um, it's like family to them, and I always have students they're very excited about getting their work done so they can play hockey <laughs> so they're good students you know because they want to do well um, but this year we um, are kind of in a situation where looking in our future it could help us and looking in their future it's something that can really help them um, and we do have very good ice time at West Side Arena. We have a wonderful relationship. I called them this year and they said, you know, we have a wonderful relationship with Merrimack. We definitely want to get you all booked in first. Um, you know, and, and it's something that we're kind of in a good situation and that, that benefits both of the other schools too. Having a solid, we have the exact same ice time for practice every day of the week and all our games are all at four o'clock. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a lot better situation than some schools that are having games at eight o'clock at night and practicing at five in the morning and their times are shifting day to day. Um, and some of them drive down to Tingsboro, Massachusetts. And so, so when I looked at it, it just kind of seemed like a no brainer. This is good for the future of our, our students and our athletes. Um, I reached out to the, um, the booster club president and she, she kind of held neutral, but she said, you know, in the future, you know, if we're looking at the future, it does appear like this is something that would be good. Um, now, 
the as far as names and I think this year we would probably you know on paper it's going to pro- it would probably be listed as Merrimack Hollis Brookline and Dairy Field. Um, and name we would probably because we have the uniforms already. Hollis Brookline's blue and white. We're blue and white. We would probably just keep our uniforms and play with them. I've talked to the uh, vendor up at Brian. He actually said they can actually retrofit the patch on our. And if we come up with a new co-op name, um, which we don't have to do right away, um, that could be, you know, we could take some time and talk about that. Um, he said that's just simple enough to change the patch on the front. So it's not like a huge cost to get all new uniforms or all new stuff. We have everything we need. And he seemed like he could have a pretty good turnaround time on that. May I clarify uh, for the school board? This needs a school board vote. And then it goes to the um, what New Hampshire Interscholastic Athletic Association. So I've been in hockey committee. Yeah. So I've been in discussion. I've already talked to um, some members of the the hockey committee, yeah. and I've talked to the lady up at the NHIA. Um, they they simply ha- said in order for everything to be considered, they just needed. Um, no less than the minutes of the board, school board meeting, and mm-hmm. they could um, move forward. Lori. So a couple things. So um, two high schools that I did work for, Campbell High School in Nashua, both had co-op uh, hockey programs. Um, for Campbell, they were just a small school, so to have hockey, they had to work with Pembroke. Nashua North, which is a, a huge school uh, with huge hockey, Uh, South was fine. North had to um, partner with Stavigan. It really was a wonderful experience because kids from the two high schools became teammates. And um, so so I'm going to vote yes. Um, I I think that um, hockey is very important in the Northeast. Um, You know, we had Timmy Schaller lived in our neighborhood, played for the Boston Bruins, you know, came through Merrimack. I mean, those are pretty that doesn't happen very in very few places where a student could get to that high level Mm -hmm. and um so we're very proud of that so i i like the tradition of of hockey and i'm glad that we're trying to you know come up with solutions and it also will save us money so that's Mm -hmm. a good thing and that was my question presumably these schools had hockey budgets that were approved this spring so how is the breakdown of costs going to be um, shared between the three schools so it, it it goes based on how many athletes we have, and I think it. it um, I'm new to this, but I have read everything, and I'm. It's it, my understanding, and from talking with the other athletic directors, I still have to meet with the committee. Um, is it just basically is a breakdown of how many kids from each town, and it does involve nobody gets cut, so everybody that comes out will be on the team, and. Um, so it, it but it's a breakdown of you know if we have 10 kids and house brookland and Dairyfield also had a combined 10 then it would be a 50 50 split jenna so i'm also going to vote yes because it feels like a very smart solution to a problem and we don't want our hockey program to disappear um, we can revisit the decision at the end of the two-year agreement or, um, you know, if we have an explosion of hockey players and just, you know, and it's not beneficial for them, right, or us to have an exuberance of hockey players. I don't know if that's the right word. My question is, can we explore this pr- option with swim? Because I think we actually have a similar problem. <laughs> um, similar, very, idea. very simple, similar situation, right? Um, and I don't know what, what hockey's like. Maybe we just have hockey coaches coming out our ears, but we do not have swim coaches coming out our ears. Um, I know this to be true. And um, hockey, like swim, we don't have an ice rink at the high school, and we, nor do we have a pool at the high school. And so this situations are similar. And local, there are other local swim teams like Hollis Brookline. I don't know about Dairyfield, possibly Sauhegan, that have small teams. Ours is virtually non-existent. You know, I never thought Our about that. Our men's team and I would love might be my kid, and <laughs> that's it. I think that's a great idea. I it mean, gives me something I could. I would reach out tomorrow and try to find yeah. some things because I think that would. Because I think we be don't have for a coach for next year or this coming year, or maybe we do. I have no idea. I don't know what our status is, but I saw it listed, and I'm just. I just want to explore the idea that you know some of those kids actually swim together on club, so putting them together would actually be a really great mojo 
you know. So thank you for the idea. <laughs> so I will uh, entertain a motion to accept the tri op hockey team proposal. I will make a motion to accept the tri op hockey team proposal. Moved by Ken. Seconded by Lori. All those in favor? Say aye. Five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite our amazing HR director, Melissa Faslick, to uh, bring before you the approval of the joint loss manual. Th and I'll, before she gets up here, I just want to say this was a lot of work that that committee did. They did um, look at a lot of different things and a lot of different laws. And uh, Matt and Melissa contributed a great deal of information for that committee and it's one of those things that you don't think about until something happens and so um, I'm excited to see um, her present tonight for you. Thank you very much Lori and as Lori you mentioned this is a great deal of work that took a committee of not 28 like the strategic plan but about 12 people and it did take a lot of work and it's one of those requirements that you know it's really hard to go through all of the language and the requirements but it's extremely important and it's not something that you want to wait until something happens to put into place so I'm so glad we're able to uh, get this before you this evening and a copy is also available on our website under the supporting materials. So the manual itself is approximately 20 pages and I've done my best to just condense it into a small presentation for you this evening, but you should have a copy in your packet as well. Um, so there are two main RSAs that uh, we are required to address with the safety program, 281A64, and that addresses worker safety, the process of warning, suspension, termination, what happens for violations of safety rules and regulations, and also plans for responding to violent acts. So those are all covered within the manual. And if you're interested in reading the RSA in full, there are pages and pages at this link here that I will not go through in depth tonight. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, RSA 277 is essentially the overall health and safety of all employees, and is it is our responsibility as the employer to make sure we have safe working conditions for all of our employees. So what are the main components of what the Joint Loss Management Committee is responsible for and covered in the safety program? Uh, we must review workplace hazards and perform building safety audits. So at each of our meetings, we meet approximately four to five times per year. Uh, we have five on the books. We had an April snow day last school year, so that sort of threw a wrench in some things, but we definitely met at least four times last year. Uh, the committee must be at least 10 people with equal parts um, employees and employers or management representatives, which we do have. We have approximately seven employees and uh, six uh, managers, so to speak. We review the prevention of accidents, so we review uh, confidentially and with names redacted all the claims that have come in since our last meeting, so slips, trips, falls, injuries, all of that we review and see how could those have been prevented. Um, we ensure safe working conditions are a top priority. We always welcome feedback, so I'll get into this a little bit into the presentation, but there's also building-based committees as opposed to just the district level. Um, the importance of reducing slips, trips, falls, or workers' compensation claims as a whole. Uh, reporting those workplace injuries when they do happen. There is no negative impact to the employee if they report an injury. I want to make that very clear. Uh, we are required to report if someone gets injured at work to see if maybe there was a hazard that we could remove so that doesn't happen again. Um, this manual must be reviewed at minimum every two years. We will review it at our meetings as well when we meet throughout the year, but I would look to come before you in a couple of years to have it reviewed again as well. In addition to the Joint Loss Management Committee and the safety program that I am seeking to get approved, we also have, like I said, school-based safety committees that look at uh, really the day-to-day -day things that might be a hazard to employees, visitors, uh, volunteers, students, anyone that comes into the building. Um, we also have a district-wide crisis response team, which I know Bill, Amy, and Matt have presented a few times on what we have been doing with that district committee. 
We also have the emergency management procedures or the famous flip charts that uh, I think some of you maybe have seen, those red flip charts within the schools. We are working with student services to provide training for employees for CPI training, um, which is the Crisis Prevention Institute, and reviewing the flip charts with staff, whether it's at staff meetings or at the beginning of the school year. Like Amy said, there's a building-based day and a district-based day. We always make sure to review those and also open communication. So we send uh, a survey to staff at, every, at the end of every year looking for feedback, and some of these safety concerns come up in that feedback, which is really great to see, so we can address that. But I would say don't wait until the end of the year to bring up those concerns. We're always here to listen. So like I said, very brief overview of the 20 plus page manual, uh, but any questions from the board? Jenna. So you mentioned building safety audits. Yes. Does that include the administration buildings? Yes. Hmm. How'd that go? <laughs> so those are still, we're walking, uh, working with Tom Tussaud to get all of those completed. We did have another audit by them. I will say the ones, so there's a very simple checklist that Primex gave to us for um, what the Joint Loss Management Committee looks for when they perform those safety audits because we are not, you know, working for the fire department and we did not go to school necessarily to perform these audits. However, it's a very simple checklist um, of those hazards. So I would be happy to provide that once complete. Perfect, because if safe working conditions are a priority, those buildings are the first ones that come to mind. Absolutely, and they are owned by the district and their district facilities, and I know in our student services building, students do enter, and they may not enter that much into the central office, but we do still have employees yeah, um, that we are responsible yeah. for in those buildings. And I would add that Bill regularly meets with students and families. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that, that central office building is not conducive, ADA compliant, or welcoming to those families and students who come. That is true. Unfortunately, it is not ADA compliant, which is a concern. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I, I know the answer to this because I've come to the committee meetings, but I think it's important for the board to hear and, and for our teachers and staff and our paras especially to hear that if you're getting hurt in the classroom, we absolutely support you and we want you to report that. And um, there's, we have to help everyone involved, but we want teachers to know that it is a safe place to come to get help and to report those. And so, I mean, it's not a conversation we like to have, but it's a reality of teaching. Along with that, is if you've seen the videos of teachers standing on desks in other districts and other towns and other states to decorate the rooms, please don't do that. We have safety training for um, ladders and things like that to make it safe. So those are funny videos, but please don't do that. We care about our employees. <laughs> I've gotten a few of those videos saying, as the chair of JLMC, I thought you would appreciate this. I said, please do not do that. <laughs> And thank you for saying that, Lori, uh, because that is very important. Any other thoughts or questions? Then I'll entertain a motion to accept the Merrimack School District Safety Program Manual. I'd make a motion to accept the Merrimack School District Safety Program Manual. Moved by Jenna. Do I have oh, a second? second? Second by Naomi. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Thank may you. I, may I just make one comment? In your introduction, thank you for recognizing the excellence of Melissa. We all absolutely love working with her. She's extraordinarily competent. Between Amy, Matt, and Melissa, three of the best school administrators in the entire state. I agree. Thanks, Melissa. All right, I'm excited to hear about these three core programs. We've discussed them in terms of budgeting. We've discussed them in terms of some content, but to see them um, launched, I'm looking forward to seeing Amy's presentation. Thank you all, and, and I'm excited as well to um, talk to you about these three programs. I wanted to start off by saying that over the last couple of years, I'm going into my third year here, and one of our priorities when I first came on board was really looking at the not just the 
curriculum instruction and assessment from way up here, but also what is happening in the classrooms and what kind of materials do our teachers have access to? And one of the things that I take very seriously in my role is that I feel that the district has an obligation to provide teachers with high quality materials. And we know that a program is not a teacher right? Teachers bring their heart and soul to their practice and their craft. But we can't expect that teachers are doing all of the planning, the preparation, and developing every every lesson, every worksheet, every project, every activity that they're going to bring to the classroom. Um, because we really want them um, planning and preparing for their students, but also providing feedback and being available to students. And also to their families and the life that they have outside of school. So over the last couple of years, I know we've had conversations at the budget level, but also um, during our meetings about how do we um, really provide not just the teachers with what they need, but what does our data, what is the story that our data is saying and how can we identify and then fill those gaps? And so if you think about where we were probably a year and a half ago, we really started with foundational reading skills. We looked at our SAS score we looked at what we were doing and what teachers had available to them and we realized that we needed to do a better job and with your support we were able to bring in a really high quality program called foundations we've talked a lot about it it's a phonics program we paired that with a phonemic awareness program called Hegarty and then last year, um, we introduced and were able to purchase Wit and Wisdom. And I know that we did a lot of, we've had a lot of conversation about Wit and Wisdom, and we're in the throes of implementing it. We had a great summer preparing for it, and we've already had um, one implementation day with teachers, and we're getting ready to have our second <laughs> implementation day tomorrow. Um, so I do just want to touch on Wit and Wisdom as that core knowledge building um, curriculum. Also knowing that the programs that I'm bringing forth um, for your approval, um, some other things that I try to keep in mind, it isn't in alignment with our vision. Lori spoke earlier about our, our vision of providing a high quality education to all students. Um, is it in alignment with our vision of a graduate and our vision of a learner? We want students that are prepared and dedicated and resilient and prepared. We, we want and feel an obligation to do that. And so when we're bringing these programs forward, I want you to know that there's been a lot of thought you know, I know all of you know me, but not everyone in the community does. We are very careful about what we look at, what we vet, and then what we select and what we are implementing. So as I go through, I wanted to give you an overview kind of of the program, what it was going, what it's going to serve, but that also all three of these programs are evidence-based. They're also rooted in research. So we're not just you know, purchasing something that doesn't have um, the evidence behind it, because in Merrimack, that's our expectation. We are doing, uh, we are bringing, you know, high quality materials, high quality instruction to the classroom. So I want to talk briefly about three programs tonight, Wit and Wisdom, which you already know a lot about, um, but Open Syed, which is our new middle school science uh, program. And then I'm really excited to talk about a core program for our K-12 English language learners called VISTA. So we've talked a lot, as I've already mentioned, about Wit and Wisdom. It's our comprehensive standards-based English language arts program. It's crafted really to build knowledge and um, help students to become successful readers, writers, and communicators. It focuses on uh, reading, writing, listening, speaking, vocabulary, um, and in the form using, of using rich grade-level texts, so not just books, and I know we've already talked about this. Um, we, we also look at artwork. Um, they have... Um, videos that they watch, speeches of, of famous people, um, but it really is, is an, an, an amazing program. If you take a look at some of the quality materials that come with it, it's just uh, phenomenal. And it also pairs seamlessly with our foundation program. So foundations, geodes, and Wit and Wisdom are all, so Foundations is a Wilson program, so that is, you know, the Reading League, the Reading um, Dyslexia Group of America, but Geodes and Wit and Wisdom are both produced by a company called Great Minds, and they follow the scope and sequence of Foundations, so there's a lot of seamless um, instruction happening there. 
We've talked about the core framework of strategic questions and instructional protocols. We've talked about the modules. Each module in Wit and Wisdom, sometimes they're called units, are about six to eight weeks. And really, writing is embedded in this program, so we don't need another standalone writing program, which was also a goal of the committee that looked at this uh, program. Again, evidence-based. Um, you'll hear a lot about the Knowledge Matter campaign and also Ed Reports. Ed Reports systematically reviews literacy, math, and science programs. Programs, um, so that schools know, um, you know, what they has evidence about why would you want to choose this program? Does it meet expectations in, in particular areas, really around scope, sequence, coherence, and usability, and is it aligned with state and national standards? So Wit and Wisdom is one of only eight um, knowledge building curriculum that are approved by the Knowledge Matter campaign, and it also received top ratings from Ed Reports. Again, we've talked about the visuals that go along and how Wit and Wisdom um, is organized. So that's sort of a little bit of Groundhog's Day. We've talked a lot about Wit and Wisdom. So we'll move on to Open Syed. So Open Syed is our new middle school science curriculum, and I'm really excited about this program. I, I know that some of you have taught science or at least are interested and curious about science. And um, when I first came on board, we were first implementing mystery science, and that was K to 5. So if you have an elementary student, you know that they're coming home and um, they are, you know, mystery science is very hands-on. There are great kits that go along with it. Um, there are videos and anchoring text and it's a phenomenon-based um, curriculum. So we wanted that same thing for our middle school students. Um, we want them to be exploring. We want them to start to think about um, things from the, the perspective of the scientific method, but also thinking about those engineering practices. So when you think about science, the core standards for that are the next generation science standards. So sometimes they're just called the next gen. And when you look at Open Syed, it is right now an open source program, um, except that the, si the student materials and the teacher materials and the kits have to come from an approved um, partner. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But you can go online right now and Google Open Syed, and you can find the scope and sequence for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, so in the long run, it's a really great opportunity for teachers and students and families to just have full transparency about what are taught what's taught in that program. Um, it, as I mentioned, it's a phenomenon-based program, so it's full of simulations, um, data collection. Um, the engineering is embedded into each of those units that focuses on problem solving and technology and how we can use those skills um, to come up with justifiable solutions. One of the things you'll find in Open Syed is there isn't just one answer, and we know that from, you know, those of us that you know look at science every day, you learn something new, right? And you might change your mind about something because now you have more evidence or you have more information. Um, Open Syed is also uh, based on the principles of universal design for learning. That's been um, part of the norm here in Merrimack for a long time. It was one of the earliest districts to adopt UDL um, through CAST, and it really does serve a diverse student population. Again, Open Syed is evidence-based when we go back to Ed Reports. Um, the science curriculums are reviewed a little bit differently, so they look at three different gateways. Is it aligned to the next gen? And does it have a coherent scope and sequence? And is it usable in the classroom? The science is just a little bit different than literacy and math because it really is looking at do you have investigations that a teacher could could actually do start to finish in their classroom? Do they have common materials that, that you could use? So again, we're choosing, a, we've chosen a program here that has an all green rating or a top rating from Ed Reports, and it also has um, really high uh, marks from everything related to the next gen. So it meets the standards for the science and engineering practices. And then the next gen looks at these cross-cutting <coughs> content. So it is what students are doing, what they know, and then how they think. So those three things are coming together all the time. I thought I'd just put up, you know, just an example of one of the um, driving questions that are based on the phenomenon. So why do we sometimes see different things when we're looking at the same object? And what students might do here is they have a, a one-way mirror that they explore why 
why I can see some things that you can't see and vice versa. Um, this is, I think, a seventh grade unit, but there's also a sixth grade unit that they, the students construct a light box and they look at prisms and they're building it and, and looking at how those pieces come together. It's really, really an amazing program. And in the lower right hand corner, you'll see um, for this first year, we've bought all of the kits and materials that the teachers will need to implement um, these lessons and these units in their classroom. So some, you know, there has been some cost up front. Um, and then, of course, we will have to replace those materials. But we were already doing a lot of that, you know, just not in a really um, comprehensive or, or coherent way. You know, you would buy things. Well, let's go to Walmart and buy some flour and vinegar and, you know, watch mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. explode. You've all made a volcano, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, but this is really here are some things that you need um, for each one of the phenomenons. Tomorrow we have an on-site um, implementation specialist coming from Activate Learning, which is the partner that we've chosen uh, to work with, and they're approved by Open Syed. Um, and they're coming to work with all of our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade science teachers, and they will come back um, in, in September, but then throughout the school year, they can be available for uh, PLC meetings, but also they'll come back in March. And we're really excited about that partnership. And then finally, an overview of VISTA. Um, VISTA is a, going to be our core program for our growing population of English language learners. And I talked a little bit about this in the spring. It's designed to specifically help K to 12 students. So it is extremely comprehensive. Um, multilingual learners close the literacy gap. So it focuses on, if you know anything about um, your ELL population or your English language learner population, they take a test called the access assessment. It's required, um, parents cannot opt out, and it, it, man, it, it measures their language development from um, when they're a newcomer, which we'll talk a little bit about that, through being um, discharged or that they no longer need direct ELL or ESOL services. So those, those skills really focus on vocabulary, reading, listening, speaking, writing, and grammar. As you know, the English language is really hard to learn. There are a lot of rules. It often doesn't make sense. And you have folks coming from all over the world. They come to Merrimack, and we're trying to have them um, access the general curriculum. So we'll use this program to help um, close those gaps. VISTA, like Wit and Wisdom, has beautiful materials, um, authentic media, rich print. It has a great digital platform that helps students K to 12. Um, really excited to be introducing a um, English class at the high school taught by uh, Jess, one of our teachers, is a duly licensed ESOL and English teacher. And for the first time ever, with your support last year, she's going to be at the high school full time. We have a lot of students there right now and she's going to be able to teach them an English class for credit uh, which is different we haven't been able to offer that in the past so we're really excited to do that and Vista is part of going to make that possible um, we actually purchased four different components of the Vista program the first is get ready that would be for your newcomers your students that are coming in and on the access testing you know maybe their proficiency level is a one or a two it goes up to six so you're really looking at those um, the unique needs of that population of students. And then you would sort of graduate, for lack of a better phrase, to the CONNECT program. And that is a comprehensive literacy program uh, for learners and our striving readers. So they have that basic language, they have the basic vocabulary to survive and get, a, get through their day, but now we're really looking at the literacy components. And then Bridges is a middle school, primarily a middle school program, and then Engage is your high school literacy program. Each one of those programs has a really robust portal that students and teachers can log into to have digital access uh, to the text. And then we also bought the, a lot of the textbooks that you see on the screen. VISTA is also evidence-based. It's not like um, a math, literacy, or science program. So uh, the evidence really comes from research and standards and proven ped pedagogy. I've had some links there um, in the slides. And it is aligned uh, to state and national standards, which is, if you can just imagine, uh, the WIDA standards themselves, that's your English language learner standards. It's also aligned to the Common Core for ELA and math, the Next Generation Science Standards, and the National Standards for Social Studies. So this program has um, not just um, state implications, it's a national program and it's used globally as well. They have a K-12 to arm, they have a higher ed arm, and then they also have um, a global 
presence. Um, so their programs are used, um, not just K to 12, but anybody that's trying to learn a different language. Um, and I d just gave some examples of something that a student may see. Uh, the first one there is really up from the Get Ready program. So you have a newcomer, they're talking about I and you, just talking about the difference between those pronouns. Um, and then you would move on to really um, looking at phonics from an English perspective. And then down in the bottom section there is something that comes from the Connect program. Um, and so you'll look at how these things are connected to language and literacy content, and then how those are put together to do reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Um, that's a lot of information. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I hope you can tell that I'm really excited about you know, the offerings of these programs to our teachers and our students. Comments or questions from the board? Lori. So uh, a couple weeks ago, seven science teachers from Campbell High School got together for lunch. And um, one of the teachers who's still teaching was a New Hampshire Teacher of the Year. And he said, I just want to tell you how fortunate Merrimack is to have Amy Doyle as the assistant superintendent of curriculum. And if there was an opening, I would come to Merrimack because I have such high regard for her. And I was just so proud, you know, to, to I called Lori up. I go, I got to tell you this. This is like so, you know, so y this is great work and, and you are amazing we're so happy to have you but other people recognize the work that you do in Merrimack I really appreciate that thank you Lori Ken so if you're ever at home on like a day like tomorrow where it's a teacher workshop day and you wonder what's going on what are those teachers doing on those te like this is just some of what th they're doing this is a lot of work um, it's a exciting work um, and I just want folks at home to know that um, you know, for the teachers to start um, taking all of this new curriculum, learning how to teach this new curriculum and getting comfortable, it takes time and it takes time for our students um, to, to absorb this information. So um, it's, it's super exciting. Um, I like everything that I'm seeing in this presentation and um, I, I would just let everyone know that with patience comes reward, you know? So just uh, allow this to kind of permeate and settle and uh, I'm, I'm really anxious to see, um, you know, six months from now, a year from now, what the results are. Jenna. So um, I have a couple things to say. I'm so excited about the science program. Um, I have a sixth grader, not to the middle school yet, but she has always said she wants to be a teacher and has went to a science camp this summer and decided she now wants to work in biofabrication. And she told me that at sixth grade, they might not have time for a lot of the labs. So she's disappointed. But now I'm looking at this and going, look what's going to happen at the middle school. And she's going to be so excited. It's in sixth grade, Jenna. You can go oh, home tonight and tell her it's sixth, seventh, gosh, and eighth grade. gosh, you are right. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. That's so exciting. Okay. Secondly, I also have the unique um, position of being the parent of an English language learner. And um, I love the fact that there is a, a curriculum, like a legitimate curriculum. I don't to be honest, haven't always looked into how it's been done, but uh, I've seen it in other districts, certainly, and, and I'm sure it's here it's similar. It's like we do what we can to support the kids, but there hasn't been a really cohesive curriculum for making sure that those kids are getting the education that they need and want. In my family, right, I'm a teacher, so my child was fortunate to have me at home doing that, but I didn't, I happen to be an English speaking adult. And a lot of those kids go home to families where they're speaking their first language, which is awesome, but they don't get that. So this is such um, an incredible gift to those families whose kids are struggling to keep up in school while not speaking English. It, it's, I mean, I don't know other districts, I'm sure there are other districts that are doing this, but this feels very big and very important. And I'm so thankful that you prioritized it because it's not our giant, it's not our biggest population of students. It's not gonna be this giant impact, but it's important. We value these kids and these families and, and we have to provide for their education. And this is huge and I'm, I'm so grateful. I looked at the science education curriculum and I was very excited about it. As a 
I mean, we're a whole family of engineers and scientists, so that's what my kids loved. And even though we've done, uh, why you, when you said it, six volcanoes, 12 cell projects, and I don't know how many science fair projects. I don't miss those days. Uh, <laughs> but I know how much work it takes for a science teacher mm -hmm. to teach the standards plus do the hands-on. And what I really love about this curriculum is there's so much opportunity for the kids to be hands-on. And that is where the real learning and integration of the concepts and the laws of science come is when they see it happening and I love the example you put up there um, some of you know this some of you don't my husband's an optical engineer so I shared that with him and he was like oh great let's teach them optics when they're young we need more optical engineers so I really really like this curriculum mm -hmm. very excited about it and I just want to echo what Jenna said about Vista we have an incre increasing population of English language learners we have a moral obligation to provide them an awesome education and to support them. And I, I totally agree with you. To see a cohesive curriculum from Get Ready all the way to Bridges and, and, and Engage, to see that we're there with them from the moment they step into our district until they either graduate from Vista or graduate from our schools. And so I'm really excited to see that. Thank you. All right, I th any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you so much, Amy. I have to say, once again, we have the best. We have the best. And I would say that about Matt also in finance. It is a delight to work <laughs> with Amy, Matt, and Melissa. I, I know I've said it probably too many times to you, but it's what makes this school district very special. All right, well, share with us about the leadership retreat. Good time. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was, uh, we had two uh, very good days. You know, historically, uh, there has been an August uh, retreat. Um, this year it was in, in Portsmouth. And we devoted uh, two very busy days uh, to working together to talk about the issues that we are facing, uh, whether it be uh, curriculum, instruction, professional development, school operations. Uh, but we also talked deeply about school safety uh, on the first day. We took uh, the morning to and devoted that to taking a look at the strategic plan by um, the members I'm talking about, all of the leadership team, uh, taking a look at the strategic plan, taking a look at the goals that we established in June, and uh, coming up with some answers to how does the initiative address part of the strategic plans, uh, any of their recommendations and their priorities. We asked them to come up with priorities. How does it address the school board goals? Um, how do we make the content of the strategic plan and the goals of the school board uh, come alive such that it operationalizes the vision of a learner and the vision of a graduate? And we're still working on, on this because this builds into the budget re request uh, coming down the road. And how will we track the progress uh, of our uh, initiatives. We broke up into uh, some teams of four or five, um, had a lot of chart paper around the room, made notes, and we'll, we'll give you um, a little bit more detail at a subsequent meeting when we sort of crystallize everything that we heard and uh, that was on the sheets that we, we uh, wrote our notes on. And so there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, <coughs> but it was very focused, and I congratulate the, uh, the leadership team for their dedicated work on working with the strategic plan and with the goals. In the afternoon, we spent um, a very important time on uh, some detailed plans regarding school safety. Um, you know, Matt's done a tremendous amount of work uh, in all of the years, <coughs> excuse me, that he's been here on school safety. But we wanted to take it uh, an additional to an additional level. Uh, we went to a great training um, in Wyndham uh, run by an organization called ILoveYouGuys.org, uh, which was run by uh, a gentleman whose daughter was killed in an act of uh, school violence. And it was one of the best trainings um, I know I've, I've ever attended, and probably those of us, all of us who attended. And, you know, I want to thank Amy for doing a lot of organizational work and getting those people from Merrimack not only 
in the district by the police department uh, to that training. Uh, it was it was outstanding. And what we did is we um, we went through an actual simulation of a school emergency uh, involving a um, evacuation to a rally point, and then. Uh, the transportation of students and staff from a rally point to an, an, an evacuation reunification site. Uh, we have uh, we have outlined very carefully what schools will go to what other locations in the event of an emergency. We've also um, mentioned and planned for any school to be potentially an emergency evacuation and reunification site. We have four that we've specified, but during this meeting, we made sure that all sites were capable uh, of having uh, and serving as an evacuation and unification site. Uh, we have designated positions, specific positions, that uh, the principals have done an excellent job of designating those members um, who will be uh, what are called reunification site leaders person in charge of a reunification site. Uh, people who will function as flow monitors, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, greeters, uh, check-in staff, reunification uh, runners, essentially, class leaders, and exit directors. Um, we actually put together, at the suggestion of this company that did the, uh, did the training, we have a uh, safety box, a good, really good size, looks like a footlocker, uh, with emergency vests, first aid kits, uh, student identification cards, clipboards, a bullhorn uh, for people outside giving directions uh, uh, to people in terms of how to flow from the parking lot, where they're going to enter the building, and the process of reunifying, uh, reunification with their, with their student. Um, Matt has purchased uh, some walkie-talkies specifically for the purpose. Um, I'm going to grab a, a little site map here. And what we did is we had every principal uh, and assistant principal detail for their site uh, and this could be any one of our six schools, uh, where the parking will be in, in collaboration with public safety officials. The flow monitors will provide uh, direction from, uh, for parents from where they are parked to where they're going to be entering the school. Uh, there will be uh, greeters uh, who will have clipboards and student information cards where parents will fill out the student's name and some identifying information um, and they will proceed into a, a specified entrance to the school where they'll be met with greeters. Uh, there will probably about six, seven or eight greeters who will take the student information card, present it to the uh, reunification runners. Those are people who will take the card, go to the site, the actual location of the building where the students are located uh, with the supervision and retrieve the student to be reunified with their, with their parent. Uh, site leader overseeing everything to making sure there's minima minimization of any backlogs. The um, site leader will also be responsible for making sure that those people who are with the students take accurate attendance because in the event that a child is not at the reunification site, we have a, a separate special site set up with guidance staff, with counselors to provide help and assistance to those parents whose child may not be at this location, all right? uh, <clears throat> which is unfortunately uh, sometimes a reality. So the site leaders will be with, with the children, uh, the retrievers, the reunification runners will get the student, the, um, and one of the reunification runners will uh, escort the parent to the exit where they will be reunited with their child and the exit uh, director will check the identification to make sure that parent uh, is with the right child and that child is with the right parent, okay, and feels safe proceeding. 
Um, we actually ran through an exercise doing that. All of these various positions between the flow monitors, the greeters, the checkers, the reunification runners, uh, the class leaders, the uh, site uh, leader, and the exit director have different color safety vests. So they can be easily identified in terms of what their role is for communication and understanding how the process is going to work, where they need to be located. <clears throat> so every principal and assistant principal took this as a guide. They each have had one of these and they still have it. <clears throat> we had a, a huge blow up of their site plan, their building uh, uh, site plan. And uh, they have indicated uh, for their respective building where the entrance will be, where the checkers will be located, the students will be located, where the exit will be located because you don't want the entrance and the exit to be in the same location. All right. We talked about the reality also that this is not a process that will take one to two hours. In most reunification processes, we're talking five, six, seven hours. So we have to be also on alert for other students, how that may possibly impact the dismissal of other students. It may be delayed. So there's what we need to talk about. What do we need to do to make sure that students and staff in other sites that are not directly impacted by this uh, are taken care of? Uh, physically, psychologically, do we need to bring in, have the food service workers <clears throat> stay some extra time, obviously for compensation to make sure that, that people are fed and, and are comfortable. The, the whole process is slow. I had the benefit about uh, 15 years ago of being one of about eight or nine superintendents who met with the um, dispatcher in Newtown, Connecticut, who unfortunately, you know, the Sandy Hook uh, tragedy took place in December, I think it was December 14th. I think we'll all remember that date. And she mentioned uh, uh, to us that the entire town was in gridlock. So these positions, as a result of that, the people who are staffing these positions will be staff members who are actually at the reunification site, the evacuation reunification site. Because our other district uh, team crisis leaders or crisis uh, staff members may not be able to get to the school in time. So each school has designated their own staff members to fill these various roles. Okay, Understanding that they will be uh, assisted <coughs> by those staff members who come to the school from the emergency site. Knowing and certainly understanding that some will be more prepared to assist, others will really probably be in a state of, of crisis themselves because of an event. We know that we can be as prepared as possible. Uh, some people will maintain their composure, some will not, and that's the reality of, of life. But our job is to make sure that everyone, to the best of our ability, understands their role in all of this so that if there is an emergency, and it may not even be a, an emergency involving violence, it may be um, some sort of natural disaster or a gas leak at a building or some other emergency that requires the evacuation to a different site, we know specifically who's going to be responsible for what task and exactly what the flow will look like. We will need the assistance, certainly, of public safety, particularly out here because we know, look, some people are not going to want to stand in line and fill out an information card. They want to get into the building, <clears throat> get their child, and we understand that. But there has to be some controlled process or chaos results, and we don't want to see that. Okay, so we had a wonderful training, and Amy, um, you know, I'm interested in your observations also because we really took it seriously. We went through an actual simulation that afternoon with all these positions, and I think everyone understands quite clearly uh, the roles and responsibilities. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I know, Laura, you joined us for the, the training, and I was there 
when we actually went to Castleton in Wyndham yeah, and then yeah. the, a couple of weeks later I was there for a wedding and I remember like coming back and thinking this is not at all what I was here for the last time so um, <laughs> but as, as Bill said at the leadership retreat it was really a great opportunity for us to unpack with the principals as he said you may be taking your students or you may be receiving students and we have to be ready for for both of those um, at bo both of those things to happen. Um, I will say that over the course of this year, as a, as a leadership team, we're going to be rolling this out to the staff a little bit at a time. As, as Bill said, you know, un unfortunately, it is the reality of schools that you prepare for tragedy. That is what we're, we do unfortunately. Um, but we really want to roll it out to the staff a little bit at a time so that they can digest it and then we will do um, a simulation or a drill in our May early release day. So we're you know working towards that, continuing to do our work with the police department who are terrific. We have three really great SROs that come in and, and talk to us a lot about you know how do we make our schools safer. Um, and as as Bill said and Lori knows, we had, mem we had um, partnership from not just the police department Department, but also the fire department um, and we were one of the only districts that had that and I was really it was great I know that some of you called in some favors um, to have people come um, so I appreciate that and I think we had a really great team and everyone knows the goal which is to reunify students with their parents safely and as quick as we can yeah. May I also say that um, our assignments go beyond the evacuation reunification site. Um, we are talking with the police department about public safety staging, uh, staging for press conferences and media, um, traffic control, which is uh, absolutely an essential. Uh, Matt will be in charge of communication and transportation coordinator. He'll be coordination. He'll be working out of the central office. The same thing with Jason Pelletier, our technology director, who will assist in any technology needs. Uh, particularly if there's uh, phone line congestion, uh, we're going to talk to him about uh, is it possible to bring in a portable cell tower, for example. Um, we have assignments for counseling uh, for both students, staff, and for parents. Uh, we have plans for post-emergency uh, coordination of uh, what, do we, what do we do with donations? Uh, what do we do in terms of uh, memorials? Uh, visitation by any dignitaries, uh, community outreach, uh, religious services, all things that we learned about, I learned about from that uh, meeting with the um, dispatcher from Newtown, uh, Connecticut. So, you know, each team, each school has their own individual crisis response team. We have a district crisis response team. Um, the kits are, are very impressive uh, that we put together. And... Um, the, I want to see if I can find the page here that has the assignments. And what we've done is we've put in every emergency box for every school uh, a list of the assignments, um, cell phone numbers, uh, all sorts of emergency information that will assist us. Um, I'm at a loss for finding it. Uh, I'll show it to you in a, in a second. But we have uh, also, we've delineated the job responsibilities. Uh, I won't share with you the reunification sites in terms of what school is going where because there are certain pieces of information that we just simply don't share in public because we don't want the bad guys to know what we're doing. Uh, it's just like some of the security measures that we've taken uh, and Matt has taken over a, a number of years. We just, um, it's best to keep it close to the vest. But here's, let's talk about vests. We have a description. Let me just remove this. Excuse me, I'm sorry to be a little bit clumsy with this. But we have a, the key reunification positions, a description of them, and what color vest each one of them is, will be wearing. So that everyone will know who's responsible for what and where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing. So I came away with, uh, from it very, very pleased that uh, we are in a better position right now in terms of the reunification process uh, than we probably were previously. 
Um, so that was the very full first day. Uh, second day, we had a leadership team meeting, but also um, over the last couple of years, we've engaged the services of one of the, one of the finest people I've ever worked with, uh, Khalees Warnham. Khalees has been working with us on cultural proficiency. How do we avoid microaggressions? How do we deal with microaggressions between students? Um, and she has, she is one of the most skilled people uh, that I've ever been associated with. I, um, I had her work with us in my former district in Massachusetts, and the staff loved her. And the staff in this district, I would have to say, same thing. Staff and the leadership team absolutely loves working with Khalees. Uh, she is a non-controversial person. She um, deals strictly with how do we get along? How do we get along better? How do we address situations? How do we calm it down and drop the temperature between students and students and staff? Um, and she has done a marvelous, marvelous job. And so we had two, two very full days, but also, even more importantly, two very productive days. And um, so we were very proud of uh, the results that we had during the leadership team uh, August retreat, and we'll carry that through this entire school year. Comments or questions from the board? Jenna. So um, that all sounds really fantastic, really like a great use of time. I want to say that, you know, obviously this week we all got a terrible reminder about how uh, unfortunate it would be to need reunification training, but how yeah. absolutely desperately necessary that would be. Um, I hope we absolutely never use all those really great plans that you all made. I hope we are prepared and never once have to use it. But I'm so grateful because I work in a district where that did happen, not because of violence. I can't even remember what that situation was, but a whole entire elementary school had to be evacuated and brought to the high school. And with no plan, it was chaos. And, it, and I remember everyone saying how you know, the kids were well-behaved, the staff did the best they could, but there was no plan, and it was just sort of bananas, you know, and they made it through because there were no heightened emotions from a terrible, you know, traumatic event. However, um, tomorrow I'm going to reunification training as a result, I think, and so I appreciate that our district is being proactive as opposed to being reactive from having this happen for any reason, traumatic or not. Um, we will now have a plan in place, and you know, which would probably need to be tweaked if we ever needed to use it, but um, it's, I'm so thankful that we're being proactive. So thank you for taking one opportunity to go to training and saying, okay, now we're actually gonna use what we learned and make this a reality, so I appreciate that. You know, uh, we, we talk periodically in the leadership team about the fact that we could, we could have the top rated school system in America, but if we don't know what we're doing, in a time of crisis, um, that's what we're going to be remembered for, and we don't want that. Matt. Yeah, just to kind of give everybody a little bit of reassurance, those, those of us who have been here for a while, we have actually done those drills, and we've done them for real and for practice, too. We have taken Thornton's Ferry during the time we had a transformer at fire, and we have moved Thornton's Ferry into Reed's Ferry. We have bussed them. We have practiced this. There's a lot, granted, there are a lot of new administrators that haven't gone through this type of scenario, so what Bill has put together, and I can commend him and all of Central Office and all the, the leadership team for working at this, you know, it's going to get them prepared to do the actual thing. So at some point in the future, I see that we actually do a, a drill and we publish that to everybody that it is going to be just a drill. But we have done the reunification sites. We have done the exit gates. We have done it both in practice and because we had to at the time. So Bill's just kind of put everything together, kind of crystallized it, organized it. Those kits that he was talking about that went to the school, that was an amazing idea to have everything in one spot where you know where it is. It's not all over the place. So done a magnificent job. That's all I can say. Thank you. May I just say, though, and I often say this to Matt, and I mean this very seriously. Matt has done as much, if not more, 
to address school safety in this community in the last 20 years than any other administrator I've ever worked with. He has been extraordinary. He has not missed an opportunity, whether it was local funding or state funding. He's got his track shoes on every time there's a notification of state school safety funds, and he has served this district uh, and the safety of kids and students exceptionally well. I do have one question as part of one of our goals is com increasing effective communication with, with parents in particular. One of the pieces of that re reunification plan is those, uh, those cards that require ID. And I'm wondering if, as it rolls out to staff and, and as you move towards drill, will there be a communication to parents when it's not a worrisome situation? This is what would happen if we needed to evacuate. You will go to where you're told you will need ID. Please communicate with your family for one person to come collect your child. You know, those kind of instructions so that the parents are somewhat prepared before we ever had to and hopefully never use this this plan. Yes, um, Matt put together a, a bifold uh, a number of years ago. We updated it about two years ago. We, ha we have to update it again, though, in accordance with this. That we, we're in the process of doing that. It's, uh, I think it was yellow at one time. It's a bright green, kind of a, a very bright fluorescent green right now. Uh, might remain that, that color, but we are updating that to make sure <clears throat> that parents know specifically what will, what will occur. Any other comments, questions? Any other new business? All right, first reading of our field trip and excursion policy. I wanted to uh, put together um, a, a comprehensive field trip policy that addresses uh, local, regional, uh, uh, local, uh, statewide, uh, regional, uh, national and international field trips. Uh, this quite honestly models a policy that I put together with others in another school district in which I was employed. Uh, it served its, the regulations, the procedures, uh, are more succinct certainly as you expect in the policy. And uh, so um, you know, I ask that you waive the first reading. Um, we'll put this out in public for a two-week period for responses uh, and comments, uh, but it has um, it has various approval criteria, and who will approve certain trips, just to make sure that there's as much codified as possible. This is what this is not meant to do is discourage any type of field trip. It's just allowing us to collect the information that's important. Uh, and that pertains to the nature of the trip, safety involved, um, and every aspect of a trip that a child uh, should be able to enjoy <coughs> with uh, staff members, uh, including you know, emergency procedures, uh, uh, food allergy issues, et cetera. So um, I'd like you to you know, have an opportunity to read it, comment on it. We'll see what the community has to say about it, but um, it served a, a, uh, another district, as I said, that I worked in very well, and I've sort of replicated that for, for Memorac. Do I have a motion to waive the first reading? Sure, I'll make a motion that we waive the first reading for the field trip. <coughs> Excursion policies. I'll second. Moved by Jenna, seconded by Lori. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Thank you. All right, we have a revision to a policy we adopted in August. Yes, we... Uh, had a promotion and retention policy, and um, pleased that we were able to bring this to you because we had no mm -hmm. promotion and retention. And at the last minute, uh, our legal counsel said, I think you need to add this phrase, and that, that is in red that you see the district's academic standards is approved consistent with RSA 192-E uh, colon 2-A comma 4. And so that will help us meet <coughs> statutory requirements. I have a motion to accept the policy with the revision. <coughs> I make the motion to accept the revision promotion and retention of students policy IKE. I will second. Moved by Lori, seconded by Ken. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Okay. Five zero zero. All right, thank you. 
And uh, next we have uh, guidance pertaining to comfort support animals. As you know, we have, uh, we have had policies uh, regarding uh, animals, uh, policy IMG, animals in schools, and we have uh, policy IMGA, service animals. Now, a service animal is a animal, no, mostly dogs, that uh, are assigned to a person to address a specific disability. Um, that is different, and they have certain statutory rights to enter into regions that a normal pet would not. Now, in an increasing number of school districts over the last several years, uh, comfort animals have uh, been introduced to help support students in times of crisis. Uh, last year, we had a, a high school student that was tragically killed um, on Continental Drive, um, a couple of different agencies brought in support animals, and uh, you know we visited the library to see them in action with the students, and it was amazing, absolutely amazing to see the interaction between the students and the pets, and the sort of the therapeutic value that they have. Now, what our legal counsel has said, however, is. <coughs> This doesn't belong in a policy because there are such no statutory rights. But we are including this at our legal counsel's recommendation in the handbooks. And that is what I'm referring to is this paragraph here. This is guidance pertaining to comfort support animals, okay? We do need to maintain some degree of control over this so that we don't we basically have a zoo in any of our <laughs> schools <laughs> and that there are specific purposes and reasons uh, and that for the most part we would control uh, this process. And so I was just asking for your approval uh, because we want to put these, our handbooks are ready to go, uh, but we wanted to bring this to you just for your uh, information and approval. Do I have a motion to accept the guidance pertaining to comfort support animals? I will make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Moved by Ken, seconded by Naomi. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Five zero zero. Right, thank you very much. Approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the, are there two? Yes, public and non-public minutes from August 12th, 2024. Do I have a second? I will second. Any edits, concerns, questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Four. Four. Sorry, four zero zero. Four zero. I thought your hand was up. Sorry, I missed it. And any objections? Any abstentions? <laughs> All right, four zero one. Uh, well, now of course I'm seeing a mistake. Well, Lori's listed as present and not present. So. That's amazing. <laughs> How'd you do that? I just How'd I do noticed. that? <laughs> it's literally Lori Rockhouse here mm -hmm. and Lori Rockhouse. Oh, yep. Oh, honestly, and, it, and, and when you didn't raise your hand, it's the only reason I looked down, and I was like, yeah, she's okay. both here and not here. So I entertain a motion to revise. I will make <laughs> I will make a motion that we revise the August 12th minutes, noting that Miss Lori Rothhouse was not indeed present. <laughs> Do you have a second? I will second. Seconded by Ken. All those in favor of the revisioned minutes, say aye. 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 Five zero zero. <laughs> All right, consent agenda. There are some resignations and nominations in your packet tonight. We'll start with the nominations. Uh, Matthew Gastongue has started at Muse. Uh, Jill Tacey, preschool teacher. Elizabeth Tomolovich, elementary classroom teacher at Muse. And Geraldine Gojen, technology teacher at Reeds Ferry. We also have some resignations. Tracy Griffinhagen, special ed coordinator at Thornton's Ferry. Heather Sylvia, special education teacher, Merrimack Middle School. Kathleen Donegan, elementary classroom teacher from Reeds Ferry, and Steve LaBelle, elementary classroom teacher. He resigned actually before he started, and Matthew took his place. So that's, if you don't know either of those names, that's why. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Moved by Ken. I second. Seconded by Lori. Discussion or questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Five zero zero. Committee reports. 
I have two. Lori. So I'm just going to have to do it off my head because I have it here someplace. Um, so I'll start with Parks and Rec. Um, Parks and Rec, uh, they uh, gave an update on the summer programs, which are very successful. Uh, they uh, also talked about increasing their fees for rentals of their buildings. Uh, they talked about the new after school programs or the building the after school programs for Thornton's Ferry and Master Cole Elementary. And they also talked about their vision for n new initiatives for the Parks and Rec. Um, and then planning and building. So planning and building, um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, both Bill and Matt for coming to both of those meetings. Uh, we did um, spend some time talking about if the two buildings were able to be rehabbed and what it would look like if they were rehabbed. Um, it's not possible. Uh, we are going to um, hopefully set up a schedule uh, to open up the building so the public can see the buildings and see the deplorable conditions and um, when we talk about safety and we talk about all of the um, things that we've talked about for the last six years and probably 20 years on planning and building uh, where where we want to go um, like I said before Lori Peters did come to the first meeting this year uh, in June uh, she did uh, give the committee a charge on uh, the expectations of the school board. And um, I don't know, Matt, um, Matt had um, a guest speaker, Mr. Martin, <coughs> if you want to just talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, we um, had engaged the services of, of an architect. This architecture firm is called Marinese Associates. <coughs> Associates. Uh, they're doing this for nothing. Uh, they designed the, uh, the middle school. They also designed Bedford High School, Bedford uh, Middle School. They've designed schools all over the place. They've been in business for around 50 years. If you've ever been to Pinkerton Academy and seen the Fine Arts Performing Center, they designed that also. So they're a known quantity, and we have had a relationship uh, myself with that firm for 20-something years. So we go back qu quite a way. So Paul, who's taken over the company for Frank. And Frank is semi-retired. He would yell at me if I would say he was retired because he's not retired. Uh, they went through and they took, took a look at um, the central office and the special services office uh, with addressing the issues brought to them uh, via the fire marshal's report. So let's take a look at these buildings. Let's see if we can get them up to code via life safety issues. Let's also take a look at them and see if we can bring them up to code to be compliant with ADA. I had a conversation with the building inspector and the building inspector says, if you're working with an architect, they know the codes as far as ADA. You know, I can just point out things, but they, they already know this. So, you know, take their advice and that's the best thing to do. So when they did review the building, um, let's see real quick. Uh, they had one paragraph. I'll just read it real quick. The current state of the buildings is very poor. The condition and quality of exterior finishes and windows, the worn out state of interior finishes, lack of fresh air, lack of compliance with ADA dimensional requirements, appropriateness of stairs, lack of safe exits, inadequate spaces, lack of elevators, old mechanical systems, and a general state of degradation of buildings that are very original to their construction in the 1950s or 60s, indicates the significant need for major upgrades or building replacements. So the purpose of the meeting with Planning and Building Committee was to see if what we could do to correct all the deficiencies to bring these buildings up to present day office space standards because the buildings are still designated as residential homes. We have not gone forward with doing the change of purpose request from the fire department that's going to request to put them as office space so we're working out of residential homes. Um, we went through that put a price tag to it and because probably most of it you'll have to just gut everything replace all the siding replace everything replace the foundation because it is a concrete block foundation in both buildings it leaks uh, it cannot support an additional uh, an additional height needed to make the uh, the floor to ceiling uh, specifications the way they should be so we can run duct work for a you know a real HVAC system as opposed to what we're using right now 
um, it was really it was into the millions of dollars so it really didn't make sense and I think at the end the planning and building committee voted not to entertain going down that path because in actuality what you're doing is you're spending a lot of money to not getting it getting any any additional space at all so why would one do that so the planning and building committee at our next meeting is going to be looking at uh, the current plan that was presented at the deliberative session and the original plan that we talked out about, about before the deliberative session to kind of look at the spaces and, and see who should fit, fit where and discuss various options. And so Paul Marinese will be at that meeting also. So the saga continues of the uh, central office quest. So. But at least we're getting good information. We're getting uh, you know factual information. When it's all done, we'll pu we'll publish it online for everybody to see. There's nothing to hide here. That meeting was public. It was tele it was televised. Uh, you you can see it on Merrimack TV if you wish to take a look at it. So. Matt, will you go ahead and tell us what Marinese put on that price tag? It was a little over four million dollars. And if I recall, their report also didn't include potential asbestos abatement if they found asbestos overruns. Correct. Mm -hmm problems with foundation other than what they are estimating so right. the potential is being even higher than that there is a potential for unknowns being in there the foundation replacement is, is kind of one of them which they're probably looking at doing but yeah it could climb four, uh, four million is probably the base okay. yeah thank you so I encourage the public to watch that planning and building committee meeting and also they are open to the public so you are welcome to come and attend that meeting that's it for me <laughs> any other committee reports correspondence I believe we were all on one particular email which I'm going to meet with Bill about um, and I received emails when is the first day of school and when do people start and what is the delay and just general beginning of the year uh, emails and I directed them to the website and to administration <laughs> building principles those kind of questions so uh, any other correspondence comments from the board just a reminder if you didn't hear it at the beginning of the meeting tomorrow is primary election day there's no school for students it's a professional development day for our teachers and staff and our administration and I think it's another wonderful opportunity to see our democracy in action Public comments on agenda items. We ha do not have any public here tonight, but the public is always welcome to come. And our second public comment section is on agenda items. And we love to hear people's feedback. Do I have a motion to adjourn? To adjourn. So moved. Moved by Naomi. I'll second. Second by Ken. All those in favor of adjournment, raise your hands. Say aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Thank you and good night. <laughs>